Claudinia Blanchard was found stabbed to death. It set off a roller coaster story. Grant, Gypsy Blanchard, along with Nicholas Godijan, are in Wisconsin tonight on $1 million bond. A woman allegedly asked her boyfriend to kill her mother. Things are not always as they appear. What would drive Gypsy to want to plan the murder of her own mother? Since the day she was born in 1991, Gypsy Rose Blanchard had been lied to by her mother, Dee Dee. When she was just an infant, her mother said she believed Gypsy had sleep apnea and a range of other disorders. Though after the hospital ran some tests to see if these claims are really true, the results came back negative. Some years later, Dee Dee then claimed Gypsy had muscular dystrophy, which to put it in basic terms, is a disease that primarily affects skeletal muscles and breaks them down over time, making the person weaker and weaker. In an attempt to take care of this perceived disease, Dee would give her daughter a walker to use. Gypsy also had leukemia, according to her mother. As a kid, and especially at such a young age, you can't truly understand any of this stuff, so Gypsy believed her mother and took her advice. Another incident occurred when Gypsy was around 7 or 8. One day, she was riding on her grinded father's motorcycle and fell, getting a minor abrasion on her knee. Dee Dee then told her daughter that the doctor said she needed to use a wheelchair and subsequently gave them one. Though in reality, Dee Dee most likely found or purchased one herself and Gypsy did not need one at all. Dee Dee began homeschooling Gypsy sometime between kindergarten and second grade. After telling schooling staff that her daughter's illnesses were so bad, she couldn't really attend public school anymore. On a positive note, it seemed Gypsy still learned how to read, having learned through the Harry Potter books. Gypsy's father around this time remarried, but Dee Dee and Gypsy would move in together with Gypsy's father and new stepmother. It was soon after this that Dee Dee allegedly poisoned some food with weed killer. Gypsy's stepmother would become sick in the following days with a chronic illness. To be clear, it sounds like the food she poisoned was only intended for the stepmother and wasn't a breakfast, lunch, or dinner for the whole family. Just some food that Dee Dee probably offered to make for the woman. It doesn't seem as though she wanted to directly poison her daughter, but it's still obviously messed up. Suspicions of Dee Dee having a role in the declining health of Gypsy's stepmother began to grow, and once confronted about it, she took her daughter and moved to Slidell, a suburb in New Orleans. After they left, the stepmother's health then returned to normal. Shocker. Dee Dee and Gypsy began to live in public housing, paid for using the money they had accrued from welfare, from the supposed illnesses, and child support payments from Gypsy's father. Dee Dee's shenanigans continued with more and more doctor's visits, somehow convincing them that Gypsy had seizures often, leading to them giving her anti-seizure medications. Around this time, Gypsy would have multiple surgeries for these fake diseases and illnesses. Hurricane Katrina would destroy the entire area that the two lived in, forcing them to flee to a shelter in Covington, made for people with special needs. Dee Dee would claim that Gypsy's birth certificate and medical records were destroyed in the flooding. Soon, a doctor there in the shelter they stayed in recommended they go back to Missouri. Various charities and organizations would take care of the two after hearing their story, and a home with a wheelchair ramp and a hot tub would be made for them. As more and more people would learn about their circumstances, media outlets would begin to cover the story. They became known as the mother and disabled daughter who fled the wrath of Hurricane Katrina. Good Samaritans would offer help and services for the two. Tons of support started pouring in from charities and the two began getting free trips to Disney World, Ronald McDonald houses, and even backstage passes to Miranda Lambert concerts. Rod Blanchard, Gypsy's father, would continue to pay child support this whole time and on Gypsy's 14th birthday, he would call wishing her a happy birthday. The thing is, it wasn't Gypsy's 14th birthday, it was her 18th. Her mother had been lying to not only her but everyone around them to keep up the facade. Dee Dee called Rod to tell him not to mention her age because Gypsy had no clue. Rod obviously wanted to help his daughter, who he knew was being used and manipulated, though, of course, Dee Dee went on to tell all of those around her that Gypsy's father was an abusive alcoholic who never sent child support money. However, this was just the beginning of uncovering the true manipulator that she was. Dee Dee knew that in order to keep people believing the convoluted story she had created, she needed to continue to make Gypsy look like the severely disabled person everyone now thought she was. She shaved Gypsy's head to make her look like she was in chemo by telling her that she would lose her hair anyway after taking the medication she was given, so why not? Her mother even brought an oxygen tank and feeding tube out with them when they were in public. Whenever Gypsy would say something contradicting the web of lies Dee Dee built, her mother would squeeze her hand. She would always hold Gypsy's hand, so this made it easier to continue the abuse. When they would get home after things like this would occur, she would hit Gypsy with her bare hand or a coat hanger. The medical processes Dee Dee made her daughter take are awful. To keep her drooling before doctor's visits, she would use Botox on Gypsy's saliva glands and extract them after. 
Dee Dee would also inject anesthetic into her gums, which would add to a problem causing some of her teeth to decay. Since so much in your face is connected, she would also begin to get ear infections, which were subsequently treated. Pediatric neurologist by the name of Bernardo Flasterstein, who Gypsy had just started visiting, still under the care of her mother, ran some tests and found no abnormalities where they were claimed to be. He contacted previous doctors and care facilitators of Gypsy's and learned that old muscle biopsies taken in New Orleans showed the same thing. Bernardo took note of this and began to put the pieces together which arrived at the possibility that Dee Dee had Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Dee Dee would learn of this suspicion and fail to show up with her daughter for future visits. At first, Bernardo thought about telling authorities but ultimately doubted they would actually believe him because those around him told him to treat the two with extra care. In 2009, local police received a call about the possible abuse and that Gypsy wasn't actually disabled to the extent at which everyone thought, so they performed a wellness check on their residence. Dee Dee told the police that she may have exaggerated some things to hide from her allegedly abusive ex-husband and Gypsy was still genuinely disabled. They ended up believing her and the case was shut and closed. Dee Dee once forged a copy of Gypsy's birth certificate to keep up with the ongoing lie of her being younger than she actually was. Gypsy recalled seeing the original that Dee Dee still kept around and felt confused at the time but wasn't sure her mother's claims that it was just a mistake were true. She started becoming suspicious of her mother around this time in her life. In 2011, Gypsy attended a fantasy and sci-fi-esque convention and planned an escape, though she was caught by her mother in a hotel room with a guy she met online. She was actually 20 at this time, but knowing how everyone else thought she was younger, Dee Dee threatened to tell the police. After this, Gypsy claims that Dee Dee smashed her computer with a hammer and told her never to try and escape again, or she would smash her fingers next time. She also handcuffed and leashed Gypsy to her own bed for two weeks straight as punishment. Things started to become slightly clearer for Gypsy about the type of person her mother really was. Dee Dee told her that even if she escaped and told the police, nobody would believe her because she was labeled as mentally incompetent. Gypsy still wasn't just going to give in to the abuse her mother subjected her to though. After being freed from the handcuffs and the bed, Gypsy attempted to escape by grabbing a BB gun, which at the time she believed to be a real gun, and shot Dee Dee ten times with it. Gypsy would start using the internet after her mother would go to sleep and reach out to various people online. One of these people was Nicholas Godijan from a town in Wisconsin. They were roughly around the same age, and Nicholas had, or I guess has, a criminal record of indecent exposure and a medical history of DID or dissociative identity disorder and autism. The two would continue to flirt online and discuss being married and having kids in the future. They reasoned that if they had kids, Dee Dee would have to accept Nicholas because he would be the father. Gypsy began to tell her neighbor, Aaliyah Woodmancy, about the connection she had with Nicholas, though still thinking Gypsy was much younger, she advised her not to stay in contact. When the next year came around, 2015, Gypsy came up with a mastermind plan to get Nicholas and Dee Dee to hopefully meet. She wanted to go to the movies, both dressed up in costume and hopefully start some kind of relationship that way in front of her mother. Nicholas and Gypsy would meet in the bathroom during the movie. Now it's time to go Sherlock Holmes in this bitch. Nicholas said that the two had sex in the bathroom stall. However, Gypsy said that Nicholas pulled out his wee wee but couldn't get the thing to go. After dense and extensive research on finding the true answer behind this mystery, I can say that I still have no clue, but it is more fun to believe Gypsy's side of things, so I'll let you decide what you want to believe. Alright, back to the dark stuff. After the whole movie thing, the two kept communicating through tech services online and would soon discuss a plan to kill Dee Dee. Nicholas would show up to Springfield, Missouri where the two lived. One night when Dee Dee was asleep, Gypsy would open the door to Nicholas giving him duct tape, gloves, and a knife. Gypsy went to the bathroom, locked the door, and covered her ears with her hands to drown out the noise of the screams. Dee Dee was stabbed 17 times in the back of the head while she was in bed sleeping. Nicholas claimed that the two had sex after this, though Gypsy says that he had actually raped her because she wouldn't let him rape her dead mother and that he had a thing for it. Gypsy even says that she had called for her mother's help while it was happening. They stole about $4,000 from Dee Dee, which were mostly from previous child support payments. They fled to a motel to lay low for a couple days, visiting convenience stores and such, actually believing they had actually gotten away with everything, though they were caught on security cameras. The two mailed the murder weapon home to Nicholas's residence in Wisconsin and took buses to get there. It was even reported that Gypsy wore a blonde wig and walked perfectly fine when she was seen out in public. 
Friends of Didi would call, text, and even check Facebook to try and contact her over the next couple of days, but obviously nothing would happen, leading to confusion and concern. There were, however, some odd postings and strange updates on Didi's Facebook page at this time. Some people showed up to the house and saw the car still parked in the driveway, so they assumed they were still inside. After trying to look through the windows or even knock on the door hoping for an answer, they eventually called 911. Once a search warrant was finally issued, the police entered the home and found Didi's body. Still unsure of what really happened and the real circumstances behind the murder, people started to worry about Gypsy and how she would struggle without any of her equipment or medication. A GoFundMe was set up to cover the costs of funeral expenses, among other things. The Blanchard's neighbor, Aaliyah, who Gypsy mentioned and showed her relationship to before, showed police the text she had saved mentioning Nicholas. This was enough for police to track the IP of the posts made and find the pair hiding out in Nicholas's home in Wisconsin. They were both taken in under charges of murder. Here, the media would finally learn the truth behind the Blanchard's lives and the abuse that took place behind the false image of a mother caring for her extremely disabled daughter. The initial sympathy for Dee Dee changed once people find out that she was the abuser. People around them and even their neighbors were stunned and left in disbelief following the outing. Dee Dee's family had thought that Gypsy was in better health than appeared this whole time and after the news came out to light about the situation, they had zero care in the world for what happened to Dee Dee. They said she deserved what happened to her and even flushed her own ashes down the toilet. Rod Blanchard, Gypsy's father, wasn't as spiteful, believing she had gone too far to simply stop lying about everything. He was happy though to see his daughter walk again with no assistance. The trial went better for Gypsy than it did for Nicholas Skodajan, mostly due to his lack of involvement in the abuse. The jury found Nicholas guilty of first degree murder and armed criminal action and was subsequently sentenced to life in prison. Whereas Gypsy, under a plea bargain, was sentenced to 10 years in prison back in 2016. All of Gypsy's life, people around her and in her life thought she was the one sick, though in reality it was her mother who was the one that was sick. Dee Dee was never formally diagnosed, but it is commonly believed that she had an extremely rare disorder called Munchausen syndrome by proxy, or its newer name, factitious disorder imposed on another, or FDIA for short. Someone that typically has this disorder does basically what Dee Dee did, where they create fake illnesses for another person close to them. It's not really clear why they do this and what they have to gain as researchers still haven't found a reason for it. Although this disorder is relatively uncommon, doctors in both Dee Dee and Gypsy's life definitely should have caught on, like Bernardo Flasterstein did, whom I mentioned earlier. I think doctors completely and utterly failed both Gypsy and Dee Dee and those that were manipulated in her path. It's actually embarrassing considering almost all if not every test result that came back on diseases that Gypsy was tested for and supposedly had were negative. From what I've seen, most people online are extremely sympathetic to Gypsy knowing the circumstances she was in and the kind of things she had to endure since birth. Some people online aren't exactly supportive of Gypsy, however, and believe she is more of a manipulator than people realize, having led Nicholas to do what he did that night to Didi. To be honest, I don't think most of the criticisms of Gypsy being some evil person who deserves more than 10 years are valid at all. From the age of 0 to 23, she had lived under the strict and abusive hand of her mother, who she tried to escape from multiple times but to no avail. It just led to more punishment. I also see lots of people claiming Nicholas is some innocent person who got manipulated by Gypsy into doing things he did, which is just ridiculous. He stabbed Dee Dee 17 times and wanted to you know what with her body after. Not to mention, he also you know what did Gypsy right after, at least that's what Gypsy says. He had violent urges and was not the super clean and innocent person. Gypsy's been on a sort of press tour involving interviews, podcasts, and even having a strong social media presence since she was released last month on December 28th of 2023. She only served 8 years out of her 10 year sentence as she was released on parole. It's also very revealing how much healthier she looks during and after serving a prison sentence than she did before and under her mother's care. Finally, at 32 years old, Gypsy is free from both her mother's lifelong abuse and her resulting prison sentence, enabling her to start a new fresh chapter in her life.